This is going to be our fourth lecture of Module 2. In this lecture, we're going to be going over grounding electrode systems as covered in Article 250. Our objectives for this lecture, we're going to be identifying the NEC requirements for grounding electrode systems, identify the types of grounding electrodes, and we're going to use Table 250.66 to size grounding electrode conductors. We're also going to list acceptable methods of connecting to grounding electrodes. Definitions. A grounding electrode, a conducting object through which a direct connection to earth is established. Remember once again our definition from our earlier lecture of earth is just the earth dirt. So essentially this is a grounding electrode is some object we use to connect to uh, the earth with. In a grounding electrode conductor, a conductor used to connect the system grounded conductor or the equipment to a grounding electrode or to a point on the grounding electrode system. In other words, a grounding electrode conductor is a conductor that we use to connect something to a grounding electrode with. Starting off here, we're going to be looking at Article 250, Part 3. Grounding electrode system and grounding electrode conductor. All grounding electrodes listed in 250.52A1 through A7 present at a building or structure served must be bonded together to form the grounding electrode system. So in other words, uh, A1 through A7 give us a list of grounding electrodes. If we have those uh, at a building or some type of structure, we have to bond them all together, and once those are all bonded together, that is what's known as a grounding electrode system. So essentially a grounding electrode system is a connection of multiple grounding electrodes. If none of them are present, one or more grounding electrode listed in 250.52A4 through A must be used. So in other words, uh, by nature of the building, sometimes some of the grounding electrodes listed in A1 through A7 won't be present. And if that is the case, A4 through A8 gives us options for a couple other things to be installed to substitute for them. Now looking at 250.52 A1 through A8 for our grounding electrodes, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what each of these electrodes are. 250.52 A1 through 8 lists electrodes to be used to the grounding electrode system. A1 is metal, metal underground water pipe. It's important to note metal underground water pipe. A2 is metal in ground support structures. A3, concrete encased electrodes. A4, a ground ring. A5, rod and pop electrodes. A6, other list electrodes, A7, plate electrodes, and A8, other local metal underground systems or structures. <coughs> so as I said before, uh, by nature of the building, some of these may not be present. So metal underground water pipe, I stress metal because when we think about a dwelling unit, residential house, typically we're going to have PVC, plastic water pipe, Typically, we won't have metal in-ground support structures. You know, typical house will be built on a slab or built on a concrete foundation. Uh, now, concrete encased electrodes, a lot of times we will have those in a residential application, but sometimes we won't. And then four through eight are things that we can typically install ourselves to constitute as grounding electrode. So let's take a look at each of these individually now. Our electrode types. So, the very first one, our A1, our metal underground water pipe. Metal underground water pipe in contact with the earth for 10 feet or more, and that is electrically continuous. So, even if we do have metal underground water pipe, it has to be in direct contact with the earth for at least 10 feet. Keep in mind, the whole purpose of a grounding electrode is to make connection to the earth. That's the whole point. So in looking at these grounding electrodes, you have to keep in mind, that is our goal, is we want this electrode to be a really good uh, connection to the earth. Our A2, our in-ground support structures, one or more metal in-ground support structure in direct contact with the earth vertically for 10 feet or more. 
So not it can't be laying flat. It has to be vertical in the ground. If multiple support structures are present, it is acceptable to bond to only one of them. In other words, we think about a large commercial building that's going to be, uh, you know, steel erected. Uh, it may have multiple uh, steel columns that go into the ground. If that's the case, we only need to connect to one of them because by nature of how a steel building would be constructed, they'll all end up connected anyway. Continuing on with our electrode types, A3, a concrete electrode that is at least 20 feet of one of the following. So we can have different things constitute a concrete encased electrode, but either way it has to be at least 20 feet of one of the following. One or more conductive bar or rod, not less than a half inch diameter, either continuous in length or multiple pieces connected together. Bare copper conductor, not smaller than 4AWG. And then we also have a ground ring for A4 encircling the structure in direct contact with the earth that is at least 20 feet of bare copper conductor, not smaller than 2AWG. Uh, so keep in mind with these uh, wire sizes here, these are minimums. We can be required to use, and we'll get into it later, we can be required to use a wire size larger than these, but we do have a minimum size. And our A5 are rod and pipe electrodes not less than eight feet in length. Pipe or conduit electrodes shall not be smaller than three quarter of an inch and where steel uh, must have the outer surface galvanized or otherwise coated for corrosion protection. So if it's a pipe or a conduit, it has to be at least three quarters of an inch in size and as our first bullet point, it would have to be at least eight feet long and it has to have some kind of coating to protect it from corroding. Rod type electrodes of stainless steel or copper or zinc coated steel must be at least five eighths of an inch in diameter. So once again, they have to be made or coated with something that's corrosion resistant and, a rod, and for rods, they have to be at least five eighths of an inch in diameter. But once again, they have to be at least eight feet long. Plate electrodes must expose not less than two square feet of surface to the exterior soil. Bare or con conductive iron or steel plates must be at least a quarter inch thick. Solid, uncoated, non-ferrous, which, you know, mean uh, basic definition of non-ferrous we covered, I believe, in an earlier lecture. Metal must be at least 0 0.06 inches thick. Once again, it's pertaining to a plate electrode. Now I have some items that are not permitted to be used as a grounding electrode. So realistically, anything outside of that list, uh, with the exception of if it is listed as suitable for a grounding electrode, uh, cannot be used as a grounding electrode. However, the code gives us some specific things that regardless of li listing or labeling, we cannot use as a grounding electrode. The following systems and materials cannot be used as a grounding electrode. Number one, metal underground gas piping systems. Now, an area of confusion I see a lot on this is that, yes, the code tells us that we cannot use gas piping as a grounding electrode. However, as we'll talk about later when we talk about bonding, we are required to bond to metal gas piping. And we'll talk about that more once we get to bonding. Aluminum. In structures and structural reinforcing steel described in 680.26B1 and B2. So we can't use any of these as a grounding electrode. Now let's talk about the, we went over the types of electrodes essentially. You know, what constitutes a grounding electrode. Now we're going to talk about how to install those electrodes. And these would of course be applicable only to ones that we ourselves would install. So rod, pipe, and plate electrodes must meet 250.53 A1 through A3. A1, if practical, must be installed below the permanent moisture level and must be free of non-conductive coatings. So this is kind of two separate ideas here. The first being this permanent moisture level. This is obviously going to be dependent on what area you're in where you're installing them at. Uh, this is the basic idea of this is we want it installed below the freeze level. 
you know, if it's below where the ground gets moist, then it's not going to freeze in cold temperature, which would impede the conductivity to the ground around it. And then our separate idea is we don't want any type of non-conductive coating because that defeats the purpose, which is we're wanting to establish a conductive path to the earth. A2, a single electrode must be supplemented by an additional uh, electrode specified in 250.52 A2 through A. So in other words, if we're using a rod pipe or a plate electrode, we have to use some other type of electrode with it as well. And A3, if multiple rod pipe or plate electrodes are installed to meet A2, which is what we just discussed, they must be spaced at least six feet apart. So a typical installation you'll see in a dwelling unit, residential application, is you'll install a ground rod. Then per A2, since you used a single rod electrode, you have to install an additional electrode. Common practice will be to install a second rod electrode. And per A3, they have to be spaced at least six feet apart. So we've talked about our different types of electrodes, what constitutes an electrode. We've talked about how to install the ones that we ourselves install. And let's talk about how we actually bond when it, come, when it involves the grounding electrodes. The bonding jumper or jumpers used to connect the grounding electrodes together must be installed per 250.64 A, B, and size per 250.66 and connected to per, per 250.70. So in other words, whatever we're using, it, if we have metal water pipe on a building, we also have structural steel that constitutes as a grounding electrode. The bonding jumper we use to connect those electrodes together must meet all these requirements. Where a rod pipe or plate electrode is used as a supplementary electrode, the bonding jumper used to connect to it is not required to be larger than 6AWG copper or 4AWG aluminum. In other words, if we're connecting to a rod pipe or plate electrode, we're never required to use anything bigger than a six gauge copper or a four gauge aluminum, period. If that is the only electrode we're connecting to with that bonding jumper, that is. You know, if we if we're leaving that electro if we're leaving that ground rod and then connecting onto water pipe or structural steel, that's a different case. But if that's the only electrode we're using to connect to with that bonding jumper, then never has to be bigger than a six or a four. We talked about, so recap everything again, we talked about the electrodes, we talked about the installation of the electrodes, and we talked about connecting them, connecting to them or connecting them together. Then of course we have our raceways for our conductors involving the grounding electrode conductors. Ferrous metal raceways and enclosures for grounding electrode conductors must be electrically continuous. They must be bonded at each end to the grounding electrode or the grounding electrode conductor. In other words, if we're using ferrous metal raceway, such as EMT, IMC, GRC, to enclose our grounding electrode conductors, we have to bond them at each end to either the electrode itself or the grounding electrode. The bonding jumper for a grounding electrode raceway must be the same size or larger than the enclosed grounding electrode conductor. And that was a pretty straightforward point. Uh, st sticking with the grounding electrode conductors, we talked about the raceway that, uh, if we're using raceway to house them, then we have the actual conductor sizes themselves. The size of a grounding electrode conductor must not be smaller than as shown in table 250.66 except as permitted in 250.66 A through C. If the grounding electrode conductor or bonding jumper for 250.52 A5 or A7 does not go to any other electrode that requires a larger size, the grounding electrode conductor does not have to be larger than 6AWG copper, 4AWG aluminum. So this was what we talked about earlier with our ground, our ground rods or pipe or plate. As long as it doesn't go to anything else, doesn't have to be any bigger than that. If the grounding electrode conductor or bonding jumper for 250.52 A3, which was our concrete encased electrode, does not go to any other electrode that requires a larger size, the grounding electrode conductor does not have to be larger than four AWG copper. 
And finally, if the grounding electroconductor or bonding jumper for 250.52A4 does not go to any other electrode that requires a larger size, the grounding electroconductor does not have to be larger than the ground ring conductor. So in other words, whatever conductor size we use for the ground ring, when we connect to that ground ring with our grounding electroconductor, that grounding electroconductor doesn't have to be bigger than the ground ring itself. And this is our table 250.66, our grounding electroconductor for alternating current systems. So essentially, if you were kind of keen on our bullet points there, the only time we really need to use this table is if we're making connection to building steel or water pipe, is when we would go to this table to size our grounding electroconductor. Because as we covered previously, we're given maximum sizes regardless of the circumstance for pretty much everything else. So the way we use this table is on our left-hand column here, we see the size of the largest ungrounded service entrance conductor or equivalent area for parallel conductors. And we have a copper column and an aluminum or copper clad aluminum column. And then on the right-hand column, we have size of the grounding electroconductor. And once again, we have copper or aluminum or copper clad aluminum. So in other words, we think about uh, to you, use an example I use a lot, a dwelling unit or a residential application. If you're doing a 200 amp service, you'll typically be using four aught aluminum. So on our left hand side, size of the largest ungrounded service entrance conductor, under aluminum or copper clad aluminum, we would go down to four aught, and we see it's four aught or 250. So if we're using either of those sizes, we go straight across and we could use either a number four copper or a number two aluminum grounding electroconductor. And once again, this would be if we're using a uh, water pipe or building steel. Now keep in mind those do have minimum sizes they have to be for both of those, uh, but this table can require them to be larger than that as well. Uh, so for instance, if we were installing a service and we were using 1,000 KC mill copper conductors, on our left-hand side, we would go down our, col our column for copper, and we have over 600 through 1,100 KC mill. So 1,000 falls in that range. So we go straight across to the right, and we see we would have to use a 2 aught copper or a 4 aught aluminum grounding electroconductor. It's very easy table to use there. Back to our grounding electroconductors, we're going to talk about the connection locations for the connector now, the conductor, rather. Grounding electroconductors and bonding jumpers are per permitted to be connected at the following locations. So these are the only locations where we can connect a grounding electroconductor and a bonding jumper at. Interior water pipe continuous with an underground water pipe electrode and it's not more than five feet from where the pipe enters the building. So if we're using that 10 feet of underground water pipe, we can connect to it on the inside of the building, but it has to be within five feet of where the pipe enters the building, at the metal structural frame of a building, and a rebar concrete encased electrode with an additional section extended from its location in the concrete to an accessible location. In other words, if we're using rebar for our concrete encased electrode, we can connect a piece of rebar to that concrete encased electrode and stub it out somewhere where it's accessible at a later date. It's obviously after they pour the concrete, you'd no longer be able to get to that uh, piece of rebar that is the grounding electroconductor itself, or sorry, the grounding electrode itself. Uh, looking at our connections to the electrodes themselves, Grounding or bonding conductors must be connected to the grounding electrodes using listed means. Connections dependent on solder cannot be used. Clamps must be listed for the type of material they're being used with, as well as for direct soil burial or concrete encasement. And that's as applicable for those last two. You know, if we're burying it, it has to be rated to be buried. If we're encasing it in concrete, it has to be rated for that. And only one conductor may be connected by a single means unless the fitting is listed for multiple conductors. So essentially all this can mean boils down to if we're connecting a grounding electroconductor to a grounding electrode, 
uh, we have to use a connection means that is listed for that type of connection. That's how you can simplify this. And that wraps up this lecture. In our next session, we're going to be taking a look at bonding.